The Yogi's Handbook by Jim Tarrant, author's preface. My own relationship with yoga started in earnest in 1990. Like I suspect many of the readers of this book, my character type is such that I am not willing to take anything on wholesale or on hearsay just because someone says it's true. This means my practice has been full of questions, and it is those questions that have led me to explore and cross-compare my personal experiences and those of my fellow practitioners against the origins of modern yoga from right back to its roots in antiquity. This inquiry is a search for an experience that is beyond my own personal limited view and at the same time is profoundly recognisable, known and familiar. A search, in a sense, for my home as something which feels fundamentally whole and true. Sanskrit Sat. Sources of Inspiration There are many sources from where inspiration and understanding may spring in one's yogic journey as the truth that yoga is pointing to is everywhere and in everything. There were many moments of inspiration in my childhood, as no doubt there were in yours. A sense of wonderment and awe, Sanskrit Chamatkara, expressed itself as a fascination with the manifest world around me, astronomy, geology, the world of nature and, of course, the playing out of multifarious relationships we're all engaged in, consumed me with a sense of natural fascination and joy. A fundamental recognition that I exist in a marvellous, exciting mystery infinitely more vast than my little body, and yet, I sensed my little body and mind, were an inherent part of its pattern, gave me a sense of life as a divine comedy. Even some TV shows struck a profoundly resonant tone with me. It seemed that, in any direction I looked, a natural sense of the inherent wholeness of life in all its magical reality was in full bloom. Some of these shows had an overt Eastern or mystical flavour such as The Water Margin, Kung Fu, Monkey and Shogun, whilst others touched me because of their compassion or otherness, Mork and Mindy, Sapphire and Steel and The Invaders. Even the end scene of The Hulk which depicted the lone, courageous, intelligent and conflicted Dr David Banner wandering off on a solitary path had inner bells ringing. As the final piano music played and he walked away from camera into the distance, I felt, on reflection, as if inward. He was clearly on a kind of qu renunciant's quest. The objective of this reclusive quest? To quieten, tame, subdue, or understand the inner beast. Internal power? So that he could find his place within life once more. Elements of these shows and others felt aglow with meaning and importance for me in ways I didn't consciously understand at the time. They felt like they described a feeling of background discomfort that I recognised, and at the same time they seemed to allude to an antidote, a reason, purpose and meaning of life. As I moved into my early teens, other contact with the East came via a love of 80s pop music. I loved songs like David Bowie's China Girl and albums like Japan's Tin Drum, which started to inculcate in me a romantic view of all things Eastern. As a result of this burgeoning love, fascination with the East, you could often find me in my early teens trekking off to Gerrard Street in London's Chinatown to buy Eastern iconography, incense and ornaments which contributed to my eclectic decorations of my teenage bedroom. By my mid-teens, my interests honed more overtly towards Eastern mysticism and Western occultism, sparked off again by musical heroes. Almost every day you fall upon my waking eyes inviting and enticing me to rise. Pink Floyd, 1971 When you've seen beyond yourself, then you may find peace of mind is waiting there. George Harrison, 1967 With this kind of influence and following a spell in art college, I continued to be streamed on a journey eastward and inward. Fueled by a recognition that there was something inside that if known would shed light on the confusing multiplicity outside, I yearned for further clarification and confirmation of this feeling. Alongside this, I felt a growing need to communicate with others who might be similarly minded. The impetus to know, Sanskrit jnana, that which seemed to lay just behind myself, found me in the last half of my teen years experimenting with psychotropics and dabbling with other perception-shifting drugs. Initially, this further exposed me to how the universe could appear when my normal patterning was derailed. But by the time I reached 20, I was beginning to find that despite some clear benefits, this method could have serious negative effects too, especially if one is over-demanding in one's expectations. 
there was clearly the potential for serious disintegration. Around this time I was working as a kitchen porter in a vegetarian restaurant in Brighton, having turned vegetarian at 16. I had only been there a few months when a new chef came to work in the kitchen. She had all the croutrement that I thought was hip at the time, dreadlocked hair, exotic colourful clothing, a pierced nose, but she came with something else as well, a deep love of yoga and meditation. Her enthusiasm and my inherent respect of her life philosophy and attitude, she was, is, a lovely human being and still a dear friend, drew me to classes. It was as if a match had been struck in dried kindling, and it was not long until I was on fire with a passion for the practices and philosophies expounded therein. After an eye-opening backpacker's journey to Africa, I travelled with her to India, where we both completed a one-month international yoga teacher's course in Kathmandu, Nepal. I turned 22 there, and by then it was apparent that I had my feet firmly planted on a path that would provide a central axis for the rest of my life. Yogic Philosophy In my early days of practice, I was principally drawn to Buddhist philosophy. My main direct contact with Buddhists was through the Brighton Buddhist Centre and the visiting monks from the Thai forest tradition that came to Brighton. The latter used to come to Brighton from Chithurst Monastery to facilitate group practice and teach the Buddha Dharma. I read a lot of books about Buddhism from the obvious commentators like D.T. Suzuki, Thich Nhat Hanh and Alan Watts, as well as direct sutra, sutta sources. I stayed in the monastery and went on numerous retreats. As well as Buddhist books, I also read the Ramanya, Ramayana, the Mahabharata, including the Bhagavad Gita, Autobiography of a Yogi, Gandhi's autobiography and others amongst the usual suspects whilst in India. Over the following years I continued to study Buddhism, picked up scraps from other Indian philosophical systems. My studies in Buddhism led me to see that even within one area of the Indian tradition there could be many ways of pointing at the moon. But it was many years before I ventured out from my own self-imposed orthodoxy of being more or less exclusively Buddhist in my studies. This venturing out became incumbent on me after I'd made the cardinal, cardinal mistake, taking teachings that I had been drawn to originally as beautiful expressions of something that resonated with something in my core, and making them into a religious dogma, something I believed in. If you meet the Buddha on the path, kill him. Linji. It was in the end the teachings of the Buddha himself that led me to search beyond the form in this way circumnavigate the pitfalls that he warned against. People get stuck in words like an elephant stuck in mud. The Buddhist tradition seems to have an inbuilt warning system which crops up throughout its various traditions and time periods. There is no path to follow. There is no attainment of wisdom and no wisdom to attain. The Heart Sutra from the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. Even one of the fundamental building blocks of the Buddhist tradition, the three refuges, the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, are themselves another inbuilt protection against dogmatizing the ungraspable suchness. Three refuges, the awakened awakener, the truths that awaken or spontaneously arise from or lead to awakening, and that manifest awakeness in actual beings. These refuges can serve to liberate from attachment to a dogma and instead point to an open engagement with the fundamental isness of things. This is a journey from a skewed position of believing in the cross confident views you've been conditioned with, Sanskrit Ashuddha Vakalpa, to a less skewed one, world views that come as close to representing the truth as world based views can do, Sanskrit Shuddha Vakalpa to the wide open, direct, empty, Sanskrit shunyata, receiving, that does not have views between it and reality, Sanskrit nirvikalpa. In the final analysis, the truth will always be beyond the scope of Buddhism, Advaita, or any other attempt to describe it. Fundamentally then, awakeness means to be alive to this moment, as juxtaposed against relating to this moment through automatic, conditioned, programmed behavior. It is a freedom, Sanskrit moksha, from having one's core sense of identity bound to and compelled by conditioned patterns running through and affecting equally body, brain, breath 
and ultimately the universe itself. Entanglement in these conditioned patterns, which runs like software programs, make reality appear to us through their lens, making everyone's truth appear exclusive and particular to them, amplifying a sense of isolation and separation. These patterns get triggered to run by multiple stimuli, again highly particularized. Our attachment to them is what the Indian tradition calls misidentification, Sanskrit mitya gnanam. This appears as I thoughts and more fundamentally as the way we relate to thoughts, feelings, emotions, likes, dislikes, views and opinions. These relationships do not always appear as thoughts, but also as reactions, compulsions, needs and feelings. The flavour of them is alluded to with such phrases as I am, I am not, I do, I do not, I am a, I am not a, I like, 